Did you know that during the Mass, the priest prays secret prayers? There's nine of them. They are here, 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 and here. Now, they're not secret in the sense that they can't be talked about. They're secret in the sense that they're, they're personal, they're private. They're something that the priest prays under his breath or simply in his heart. I will show you where each one of those are and what's happening with them. But first, I want to say a word about uh, how we're supposed to pray always. St. Paul says to the Thessalonians that they should pray without ceasing. Now, that's a really confusing sentence because if I thought about that only in the formal sense of prayer, like kneeling and bowing my head, well, then I would never eat or sleep or have conversation with others or make YouTube videos. So obviously, St. Paul doesn't mean that we should only pray always in a formal fashion. There must be a broader meaning to that. And so, so many saints and theologians have thought that through for centuries. I like St. Thomas Aquinas' answer on that. He actually says there's there's three facets to that. First is, yes, we need to have those dedicated times for prayer, and we need to give ourselves completely to that time of prayer when we have the opportunity. The second, he says, uh, in kind of quoting St. Augustine, we need to nurture a deep desire for the Lord and for the Lord's will. Uh, because Augustine says that as our, our heart grows with a desire for the Lord, that's actually a continuation of our experience of prayer. And then Thomas Aquinas tells us to care for the poor. This is an interesting one. He says that when we care for the poor as a response to the Lord for what he's been doing in our lives, right? As we do that, that person who's received from us will thank God for us, will be praying for us. And so in a way, our act of charity has continued itself into an act of prayer in someone else's life. So, so those are three ways of praying always. Pray in a formal way, pray with a desire, longing for the Lord, and pray by taking care of the poor. We don't have to be in formal prayer at all times. But when we are in formal prayer, when we're actually setting aside time, carving out time to do it, then we need to make the most of that time. We have to work hard to keep our mind focused, to keep the distractions out. And that's hard to do. That's probably hardest to do when we're at Mass. When we're in the communal worship that we're called to do, it is hard to stay focused because, I don't know, our mind can get on a lot of things. We can be thinking about what's going to be for lunch after this Mass is over. We can be thinking about that really adorable little baby sitting in front of us. And the priest has the exact same struggles as everybody else. The priest also struggles with paying attention during Mass. We're also thinking about lunch. We're also thinking about that adorable little baby sitting in the front pew. There's a lot of things that can distract us during Mass. And so throughout the history of the church, a number of these secret prayers, these private prayers, have been written into the liturgy to ensure that the priest is praying with his whole heart. So they, they tend to happen in these, these silent beats, these little moments in the Mass. It's a way of staying in touch with the Lord and continuing to nurture those holy desires for him. I will show you what these prayers are, where these prayers are, and then I'm going to take a moment and just offer a suggestion on something that we can all learn from this in order to stay more focused at Mass. Number one, the prayer before the Gospel. Normally, if there's a deacon at Mass, the priest will bless the deacon before he proclaims the gospel. But if there is no deacon at Mass, then the priest goes to the altar, quietly says a prayer, and then goes on to proclaim the gospel. The prayer that the priest says is this, Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. So this prayer is not just a prayer that I would uh, say the words nicely in a way that people are going to hear it, but also that my life would be converted to the gospel, that my, my heart would be converted and therefore shine forth the truth of the gospel with my very life and not just with my words. Number two, after the gospel. While the priest or the deacon kisses the gospel book, he says this, Through the words of the gospel, may our sins be wiped away. These words were added to the liturgy at that moment, right around the year 1000, and they're simply a reminder that the forgiveness of sins is really at the heart of the message of the gospel. Number three, the preparation of the gifts. As the bread and wine are prepared for the Eucharistic sacrifice, wine is poured into the chalice, followed by just a little bit of water, and the prayer that goes with that action goes like this. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. This prayer is a reminder that God became man. He shares in our humanity. And by our union with him, then we get to share in his divine life. We get to share in the life of God's grace as he transforms us from within. We have been praying this prayer at that moment in the liturgy since about the 900s. Number four. While the bread and the wine are being prepared, the priest says a prayer that uh, this sacrifice might be acceptable to God. Uh, we've been praying this prayer since the 800s. It goes like this. With humble spirit and contrite heart, 
May we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Number five, washing of the hands. The priest has been instructed to wash his hands at this point in the liturgy since the 100s. And while the priest washes his hands, he says these words, Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is simply a prayer for the priest to reflect on his own unworthiness of sharing in Jesus' priesthood. Number six, after the consecration, the priest breaks the host. He then takes a small piece of that host and he drops it into the precious blood of the chalice so that the two commingle. We have been doing this very action since the 700s. The prayer that the priest says while he does that goes like this. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Number seven, after the Lamb of God, the priest has his pick. He can choose one of two of these uh, personal, private prayers to pray. Uh, they're both really beautiful. I think these are the most beautiful of all of the secret prayers that could be prayed at Mass. Both of them really focus on the fact that Jesus is the only source of healing. He is the only source of freedom, really, in our lives. They go like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit through your death gave life to the world, free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be parted from you. Or the priest may pray these words. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Number eight. As the priest is about to receive Holy Communion, he holds that host and he says, May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. And then he holds the chalice and he says, May the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. You might be in a parish where you find that the priest says this publicly, says this out loud for the people here, that's fine. But historically, this has been one of those secret prayers. The priest has been praying these words since about the 900s. Number nine. The last of the secret prayers happens during the purification. So as the priest or the deacon is purifying the vessels, meaning that we're gathering up every crumb, every droplet of precious blood that we can find to consume it, uh, the, there is a prayer that goes like this. What has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. It's a beautiful prayer, and it's a simple reminder for us that everything that God gives to us in this life is intended to prepare us for the gift of eternal life with Him. So those are the nine secret prayers. These prayers were developed by the church over the centuries to help the priest focus on what he's doing, help to kind of push those distractions out of the way and continue nurturing that inner dialogue with the Lord. If I had a suggestion related to this, I would say, Find for yourself something that you can do to keep that inner dialogue going during the Mass, rather than in those little moments when there's not much going on or it's really quiet, rather than looking at your watch or, or watching or feeling like you're waiting. Instead, let those be little moments, those little silent beats where you can talk with the Lord, even if it's just as simple as saying, Lord, I love you. Right? You can say, Lord, I love you in uh, every little moment where there's silence. You could even do it in those moments when you're fully distracted and you bring yourself back. It's a great reminder for yourself of why you're there, what you're doing this for. I think as we develop that, that habit, that inner dialogue with the Lord in those moments of silence, then it really does help us to pray without ceasing. God bless you. <laughs>